Um, I'm going to be using my iPad for notes. I promise I'm not on Yik Yak most of the time. Um, so I'm a huge nerd for startup history. Uh, I spent a fairly considerable fraction of my leisure time over the past year reading histories of Oracle and Microsoft and Facebook. Um, it was really exciting. Um, but there's this phenomenon where if you're interested in startups or if you're thinking, in star uh, if you're thinking of starting a company, uh, you don't quite get the full picture because companies want to put the best face forward. They want to whitewash things a little bit. And so you, then, you don't end up seeing the really interesting detail and the uncertainty from the early days of a company. Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do um, over the course of talking to you today is give you <coughs> a little bit of insight into that uncertainty, into what it's like in the early days. Um, and if I don't do a good job of that in, uh, in this part, uh, we'll be going into questions maybe half an hour in, uh, and you can ask the, uh, the tricky questions. Um, so maybe we should start off with what is Stripe? Uh, and this is not maybe as easy a question as, as it sounds. So one answer is that Stripe is a, a really easy way to accept payments online. This is why we started it. Uh, back in 2009, when we had been developing web products, we, we had been developing apps. Um, you know, the, the two options you really had if you wanted to turn your product into a business uh, were, one, you could send your users off-site to PayPal. That experience kind of sucked. Or, or two, you could sign up for a merchant account and go through the weeks of work and, and building out your own payments infrastructure that that entailed. Neither option was really good. And so you know, one way to look at Stripe is, uh, is that, uh, a better way that came along to, to accept payments. Um, but if you zoom out a little bit, you can look at uh, as a platform for running your online business. So we've seen, thanks to the internet, an explosion of not just new businesses, but new kinds of businesses, new business models. Uh, you look at software that previously was sold on a license basis uh, is now all delivered via the cloud uh, as software as a service. It's all subscription services. Uh, or you see that services that were previously kind of offline um, delivered on an ad hoc basis uh, are being delivered by marketplaces that can help with discovery and liquidity um, and uh, trust and safety. I'm talking about Airbnb for travel or Lyft and Uber um, in, the, in the transport segment. Uh, and it goes you know, into every vertical like, uh, like home cleaning or, or errands. Um, and so as all these new business models emerge, to actually to run the business, if you're a subscription business, to keep track of how much everyone is paying you and actually build them, or if you're a marketplace, to run the pretty complex operations and move all the money around in, in a variety of different companies to make that happen, um, this was hugely challenging for people, and they were all building it themselves. And so what Stripe really does is gives them a platform so that they can use Stripe for all that and not have to build it themselves. So maybe that's another definition. But if you zoom out even further, maybe Stripe is just better economic infrastructure for the internet. Uh, thanks to the way the internet has emerged, uh, we have this global system that lets anyone share information. But money definitely doesn't work that way. Um, you know, in the US, we have credit cards. And we think of them as pretty global, but they're not. Uh, in Kenya, everyone uses a mobile money system called M-Pesa, um, which is on feature phones. Um, it's, it's, it's really far advanced. 43% of Kenyan GDP flows through M-Pesa, um, and no one really uses a credit card. Or in China, everyone uses Alipay, um, the payment arm of, of Alibaba. Uh, and so we've erected this kind of Tower of Babel uh, when it comes to, to money on the internet, where we have a bunch of sy different systems, none of which interoperate. Uh, and our idea with Stripe is that by using Stripe, you should just not be able to have a, a system for processing credit cards, but a way to accept money from anyone anywhere. And so, you know, neither one of these answers is more correct than the other. They're just all different answers at a variety of, of Zoom levels. Uh, and one phenomenon I think is really interesting about startups is they tend over time to, to get higher and higher up in, in how they describe themselves. And that's OK, and that makes sense. 
But the, the sneaky thing they do is they pretend that that's how they viewed themselves all along. Uh, and so you have this great Silicon Valley phenomenon of you know, the founding myth that you know, we set out to revolutionize app discovery. I mean, what does that even mean? Um, and you know, one of my favorite examples of this um, is uh, I saw an interview with Elon Musk, and I mean, Elon Musk is, is clearly an incredible entrepreneur, uh, and he's someone I respect a lot. But he, he was giving this interview, uh, and the interviewer was asking him, you know, payments, electric cars, space travel, you know, what, what connects these? Uh, uh, and Elon kind of looked very thoughtful, and he's like, well, when I was in college, I thought the, the three biggest opportunities for, for mankind were uh, the internet, interplanetary space travel and clean energy. It's like, really? <laughs> that, that visionary? Um, and, and so what that means is, uh, as you're trying to think, you know, is this a valid startup idea? You know, maybe you've identified a problem, but it, but it seems very tactical. You don't know what the, what the broader vision is. Um, one stark uh, counter example here is I really enjoyed uh, Travis Kalanick uh, in describing uh, Uber recently, you know, Uber's latest tagline um, is transportation as reliable as uh, running water available to everyone. But uh, Travis, I remember in a, in a while ago described in an interview, um, you know, someone asked him uh, wh why he started Uber and he said, uh, it was a lifestyle thing. Me, my co-founder and our hundred friends could roll around San Francisco like ballers um, in Mercedes S classes. Um, so that, that, that's maybe a little before the, uh, you know, the transportation is as reliable as running water. Uh, and so, so I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that you don't always know in the early days what the largest thing is. Um, for, for me and Patrick, when we, when we started Stripe, you know, the, the market research we did was we knew this was something we really wanted as developers. Um, and we, we had one or two friends who wanted it. Um, and that seems like an addressable market right there. Um, and over time, we've come to realize that this is, in fact, uh, a really large and, and meaty problem um, that we can be tackling. Um, the other challenge in the early days of startups, well, that sounds kind of trite. There's a lot of challenges. Let's talk about another challenge. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, media tropes is the, you know, the, the multi-year overnight success. Um, people talking about how, how quickly startups uh, get to scale. I mean, e even in Stripe's case, I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of uh, newspaper articles that literally describe it as an overnight success. Uh, it's like, hey, you weren't there. Um, <laughs> uh, in our case, we, we spent a, a really long time uh, in the early days building out the product uh, and trying to figure out uh, would it work and what the right thing was. And so to give you a sense of scale here, we started working on Stripe in the fall of 2009. Uh, and we launched Stripe in September 2011, which was around about two years later. Uh, and, and I remember, you know, right at the beginning when we were starting it, um, I, I, I said to Patrick, um, you know, yeah, let's do it. How hard can it be? Um, which gives you a sense of our mindset. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the answer was two years of, of difficulty. Um, um, we, we had not predicted that. Uh, and when we launched two years later, um, do, does anyone want to take a guess uh, how many users Stripe had? 10. F close. 20. 50. Um, so we, we had spent two years building out the, the early product uh, and acquiring those, those 50 users. Um, and you know, when you're spending two years getting 50 users, it doesn't feel like a whole lot of progress. Like it feels like things are going pretty slow. Um, and this is the challenge, you know? If you have, uh, if you're working on a startup that's a bad idea, um, it's going to feel like slow going. But also if you're working on a startup that's a good idea, it may feel like slow going too. Um, I, I think the thing that, uh, that really allowed us to take off in the subsequent years was the fact that since we were spending so much time on each one of those users, since we were hyper-focused on building out a great product, and since we weren't dealing with problems of scale yet, that allowed us uh, to really build the product that we wanted. Um, one of the, one of the 
cultures that set in really early on was taking almost abnormally good care uh, of those early users. Uh, and so uh, I think someone wrote a blog post about this, but uh, we, we set up the, the Stripe API to email us anytime someone ran into a bug. So you know when you run into a bug on, uh, on any site and you know, it shows the error message or something, uh, in, in, in that case, uh, on the Stripe, it would email us and occasionally phone call us. Uh, because we figured, you know, when you're there as a developer integrating this product that you expect to be reliable, running into that bug is a terrible experience, and we wanted to fix it. Uh, and so it would alert us. We would often, I mean, we, we weren't doing anything else at the time. We would often open our laptop and start fixing it uh, and send the user a friendly email of, uh, you know, hey, that bug you, uh, you discovered just there, it's now fixed. And people's minds were blown by this. Uh, sometimes they even found it a bit creepy. Um, we, uh, we set up a, a campfire room that any of our customers could come into um, at really any hour of the day or night. Um, we even, if, if people were based in, in, in the Bay Area, we would let them come by the office and we would just sit over their shoulder and help them integrate Stripe. Um, we had in the, in the bottom right of the Stripe dashboard a, a, a little prompt that would change on every page load. It would say, you know, the thing you guys should improve here, or a feature I really want is, or the worst thing about that this page is, uh, and people would fill it out and hit enter. And again, because you know, there were so few users, we would reply within 10 minutes. Um, people would find a little odd. Um, what this meant was that even though the user growth was, you know, happening quite slowly in the early days, it actually had a really surprising viral effect where people had a really good experience, they told their friends about it, and, and we were able to spread entirely through word of mouth, even to this day. Um, we actually baked viral mechanics into the product. Um, so for, for the longest time, it was available in uh, invite-only beta mode. Um, and uh, I, I guess you don't really think of payment processing as a, as a really viral social thing, um, but the only way for the longest time to get access to Stripe was, uh, was to get invited by someone who knew it. Uh, and so again, you had this phenomenon where people were not only you know, signing up for Stripe, but being recommended to it uh, by someone who was already using it, who knew how to use it. Um, and it really helped not just with user growth, but user engagement. Um, the other challenge you'll face as you uh, go through that early stage with, um, with those early customers is really figuring out what is core to the product um, and what is not. You know, maybe another way to phrase this is, um, what, is uh, what should be part of your vision and what will need to change as you hit obstacles with customers. You, you can even probably define vision uh, as the things that you're not willing to, ch to change. Um, uh, there tends to be a lot of debate over the, the lean startup methodology where you should you know, uh, have a product, show it to some customers, rapidly iterate based on their usage and their feedback, versus the very vision-driven product of, uh, you know, I, I know what this is and I know where it should go. And to me, that's, that's not really a trade-off at all, in that you need some small set of things, uh, the vision that you're not really willing to compromise on. Uh, and then, with, with the remainder, I mean, if the market is telling you that you're wrong, you really need to listen to that data. Um, you know, in Stripe's case, uh, I think, you know, we were really focused on uh, an instant onboarding experience, building a developer-friendly um, uh, tool as our path to market. And I think you know, th that was stuff we were really willing to compromise on. If that wasn't a valid way to build this company, you know, I I I'm not sure we would have been able to pivot out of that. But in every other area we, uh, uh, we explored the market, we, we just kept running into feedback from customers that ended up being really critical uh, to, to, to allowing the product to succeed. So it's not a vision versus you know, iteration trade-off. Um, it's a selection of the things that you really believe in and then being willing to, 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 to contort yourself to make it work uh, around that. Um, and related to that in the vision category is that there will be things in the early days of a startup that make sense in the early days um, 
that, that don't scale later on. And so you know, it's not just a question of, you know, it, it's more of a continuum. There, are, there aren't just things that you should not change and things that you should be willing to change on a regular basis. It's, there will be things that you should not change for the first two years and then gradually need to be unwound as you grow. Uh, and so, you know, in the early days of a company, it's probably really critical that they focus on the US market. You know, trying to win all markets is a distraction. But clearly, over the long term, focusing solely on the US market is wasteful. Uh, and they should, uh, they should go international. Or Facebook, for the longest time, they had the mantra of, of move fast and break things. Um, and this really made sense for them. They were trying to have a really fast product cadence. But at a certain size, you get so big um, and so interconnected that moving fast and breaking things probably isn't your motto. And so they, I mean, they recently explicitly acknowledged that they were moving past this. Uh, startups end up having a really powerful path dependence where uh, you know, it, it's not just a question of arriving at you know the final answer. And if you had uh, if you had found that final answer earlier, you could have gotten there much quicker. It's a question of you know building a set of assumptions, following those, and continually revisiting them. You're, you're not just trying to arrive at the final form for your product. You're trying to get all the intermediate forms in the chemical reaction that get you there. Um, you know, a good example of this is is Microsoft. They started out in the, uh, you know, in the hobbyist market uh, building basic compilers. They, could, they couldn't have stayed there uh, and you know, could never have become the company they are today as a result of uh, you know, b b building compilers. Um, they had to move upstream, and they're now basically an enterprise company. But at the same time, they couldn't have started as an enterprise company uh, because no one would have bought from them, these like, two random college kids. And so again, there's a, this path dependence to Microsoft's growth, where they had to become each one of their stages to allow them to jump to the next level. Um, maybe another example of this is you know, go going back to Uber. Uh, if they had just started out with their Uber X model today uh, doing ride sharing, they probably would have been shut down pretty quickly. Uh, it required them to, <coughs> uh, you know, to, to succeed. They needed to start uh, with the, the limo business, uh, get to such a scale that it was a well-known and, and well-liked service, and then they could start doing ride-sharing in some cities uh, and, and prove that it was a popular model. Um, the last thing I briefly want to uh, touch on on this topic is um, that of startup opportunities. Uh, you know, people often ask this question of, where do I find the idea for a startup? And I think in, you know, in Stripe's case, uh, it was, you know, in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, building an online business was really, really hard pre-Stripe, uh, and starting a service to, to make that easier would seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, and that goes for, for a lot of other companies as well. You know, anyone who had ever taken a cab in San Francisco, you know, should have had the idea for Uber. Uh, or, or in the case of Slack, you know, we internally were struggling, struggling with the problem of team chat. And not only that, everyone we knew was struggling with the problem of team chat. And, and so the idea to build a, uh, to build a company to, to, to tackle that uh, seems obvious in hindsight. But that, obvious in hindsight, that obviousness in hindsight doesn't really help you, right? Because you know, if you only realize these opportunities after they've come along and someone has shown you the path, uh, that doesn't really help you get anywhere. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have read uh, David Foster Wallace's uh, commencement speech uh, called This is Water. Um, it's really, really good, and you should, you should check it out uh, if you haven't read it. But uh, you know, in it, he uses the story of uh, a big fish passing two little fish, uh, and uh, the big fish says to the little fish, uh, hey, guys, how's the water? Uh, and they swim along and pass him, and once it turns to the other, and it's like, what the hell is water? Um, and he, he used this anecdote as, uh, uh, you know, to, to then go on and explain about being mindful in the in the day-to-day -day lives that we live. Uh, and th there's sort of a little bit like that in uh, as you think about opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis. We live in a world that's completely broken in lots and lots of, of small or big ways. Uh, and We've come to just work around them. We've come to take them for granted. Uh, and so to, to spot opportunities requires you to 
jump out of that mode briefly and, and question how things work uh, and be unreasonable in suggesting that it, it's not valid for them to work this way. Uh, and you know, it, it should be interesting to note that the, the companies that are often successful in changing an industry are often not started by insiders because the insiders you know, know too much about that industry. They've been swimming in that water for, for too long. You know, certainly it was the case in, in, in Stripe's case. Uh, as we came to learn more about how the payments industry worked, we could see the reasons why everything worked the way it did. You know, before Stripe, to get set up with payments online, you know, generally took a few weeks uh, and it was a whole bunch of paperwork. Uh, and you know, as you as you get more into the banking industry, and people say, you know, oh well, you know, we need to collect that information to run our underwriting checks and fulfill our KYC BSA requirements. You're like, hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it requires you to stand back and say, no, no, wait a second, this is not how the internet works. Um, and, and so I think there's a there's a certain uh, practice you get a, have to get into in in how you look at the world um, to stop accepting everything as reasonable. Uh, in how it works. Uh, we are all swimming in opportunity, but it's often really, really hard to see it. Uh, and with that, I think we might uh, take a break there and move to questions. Right, perfect. So, this is the way it's gonna work. I'm gonna ask a first couple of questions, but I'm gonna open it up to you, so you can be uh, noodling on the type of questions that you wanna ask John. You mentioned several times, yep. starting this with your brother. Mm. Is that a good idea? Talk, talk about, I mean, obviously, it's been very successful. <laughs> but tell us about what it's like and, and what the opportunities and the challenges of starting a business with a family member. Yep. Um, so I get this question all the time, you know, often from, uh, you know, fr from reporters or whatever. Uh, and, you know, generally my response is to say that, uh, yeah, we got all our disagreements out of the way when we were five uh, and then tried to move the conversation along. Um, but now that I've told you that, so that won't work here. Um, <laughs> You know, I think uh, starting a company with someone is, I mean, one, just on the face of it, it's hard. You know, it's often seven hour uh, or seven day weeks and then 14 hour days again and again and again. Uh, and uh, going through a lot of uncertainty, a lot of setbacks. Uh, but also in the, in the actual work you're doing and the working style, um, you're, you're probably, the, the, the group of people starting the company are learning a huge amount as they go along. You know, they're wrong a lot and discovering they're wrong a lot. And, and all this adds up to you need to have a really good working connection. You know, if you already know the person, you need to have a, a really good working connection with them. Uh, and if you don't know the person, you need to develop that really fast. Uh, and so I think we were lucky in that, you know, Patrick and I, I mean, not only had we grown up together, but we had worked in a startup before, we had worked in projects before. And so all the, the meta issues of working style and how we worked together were out of the way. Uh, and, and we could focus squarely on the task at hand. And, and I think if you look at a lot of, <coughs> a lot of uh, successful teams, you know, generally they had a history of working together. You know, you often see people who had worked together for a long time at previous jobs starting a company together. Uh, I'm not saying that's a, a necessary requirement, but I think if you actually look at the data, uh, you have this phenomenon where it requires you to either get lucky in finding someone that uh, you work really well with, or pick someone where you, where you know that's the case. Did you have a very clear division of labor from the beginning, or is that something that's evolved? It, it was totally unclear in the beginning in that, you know, there was this huge amount of work and we both just tackled it. Great. And you chose to go to Y Combinator. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and how it influenced the evolution of the company? Yeah. Um, I think YC is really valuable, uh, especially for people like us where we were, you know, fairly new to the valley. Um, we were, you know, working in a business that required us to understand how, uh, how the Valley operated and worked. Uh, you know, we, it would have been very useful to have a network for hiring, for business development, for you know, raising money, things like this, and we didn't. Um, and you know, most investors will 
say, you know, on their homepage that they don't accept cold pitches. You know, you have to be in that network already to be able to, to participate in this system. And so YC is quite cool and unusual in the way that, you know, there's a standard application form on the, on the site, and that's actually the only way uh, that they accept pitches is you, you know, anyone from anywhere in the world can, can, can fill that out and get a spot. Uh, and so well, I think what was val valuable for us was the fact that you know we were we were pretty new to, to this. It helped us you know get into this world. Um, and you know if, to give you a, a concrete example, uh, in the early days of Stripe, it was uh, I mean it was a lot of work convincing people to uh, to use it. Uh, it was this new unproven tool that you were going to build your whole business on. I mean it's kind of a scary undertaking, uh, and so. Uh, it was uh, a lot of our early customers were were YC companies who we knew through that you know they knew we were we weren't going to disappear in the morning um, and uh, they were willing to uh, to integrate Stripe. Fabulous. So anyone in the room want to start out with the first question? Yep. Okay. So uh, I want to know uh, your childhood together with the uh, uh, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, childhood. Your childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, three days on childhood. Three days with the entrepreneur. Um, Was the question asking about his childhood as yeah. an entrepreneur? Yeah, childhood three days with the entrepreneur. Okay. Hmm. Um, grew up in the middle of nowhere in Ireland, um, in a in a small town in uh, County Tipperary, and uh, you know, read a lot of books, um, used the internet a lot. Uh, I mean, ch childhoods. Pre-internet and post-internet do to, 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 to do seem to be very different. In that uh, pre-internet, you're mostly limited to a, a very local circle, uh, and you know, post-internet, you're making friends with people all over the world and learning a new thing. You know, I, I uh, first coded when I was 14. Um, I, I built a website that um, Patrick subsequently, Patrick, my brother, subsequently comprehensively hacked, um, which I guess was a. <laughs> A good lesson in never try anything. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not still bitter about that one, um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I think uh, you know, 20 years ago, would it have been as easy for you know me to come out here from uh, to come out here from there uh, and do something like Stripe? It it seems unlikely. So clearly, you're someone who has a lot of ideas, right? <laughs> Starting at a very young age, you were building things. How did you pick this as the thing that you said, I know I'm going to put all my energy behind this problem to solve? Because this is a huge problem for a lot of us, right? It can be an interesting dinner table conversation or hanging out with a friend saying, you know, this is a problem. Someone should solve this. Which is the one you say, this is the one I'm going to solve? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really hard Problem, and you know, it sort of comes back to the, um, uh, you know, uh, bad ideas take a long time, and you know, never quite achieve escape velocity. But good ideas often take a take a, a really long time to achieve uh, escape velocity too. Um, you know, in in the case of Stripe, uh, it was actually for the the first few months uh, we were also working on this series of iPhone apps. You know, it was is one of the projects we were working on, but we we're also in college at the time, so we were juggling kind of class and these iPhone apps and Stripe, uh, and so it was definitely not our exclusive focus. I think the thing that really convinced us in the early days was, uh, and this might be specific to you know more developer or business focused companies rather than consumer which can get to scale really quickly but i think in the um, uh, in our case what uh, really convinced us was the fact that the users we had were so so passionate you know this was not just for them you know something marginally better but they thought that it was it, it was life changing and revolutionary and they wanted to tell all their friends you know they wanted us to build a way for for them to invite their friends to it you know that seemed to, to really get uh, uh, th that got our attention, uh, and so I guess you know most of the metrics that people talk about day to day, like revenue or user numbers, those are all lagging metrics. Mm -hmm. And you, as the person actually working on the product, you have access to leading metrics. Uh, and so you know, uh, uh, apparently with um, with uh, Snapchat, one of the earliest, uh, or sorry, one of the most compelling metrics in the early days was uh, the the number of times 
per day, each person used it, mm -hmm. in that you know, even if this wasn't really big yet, it was growing very quickly, and it seemed to have a really deep connection with each of its, its users. Uh, and similarly for us, I think the, 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 the passion that the early users had about the product was that leading metric that, that, that indicated to us that something was there. So, but I, you know, I think in, in each case, that leading metric is going to be different, but you want to find what that leading metric is to be able to judge whether this is going to take off or not. So this is a, a space that has become very, very busy with lots of other companies. How do you think about your competition? Is this something that you think of it as a cat and mouse game with features? Do you say, I don't pay attention to them, yeah. we've got our own path? Talk a little bit about competitors. Yeah, it's, it's sort of funny in the, um, you know, in the early days uh, when we started Stripe, you know, people would say to us, like, really? Payments? Like, why would you start a payments company? And then in 2012, there were like all these payments companies and people would say to us, you know, man, payments, that's like a super hot space. That was a great <laughs> idea, you guys starting that. And you're just like, the whole time you're kind of nonplussed by all these, uh, by all these reactions. I think there's, um, there's, it's it's important to be really clear in your own mind and, and as time goes on, be good at communicating what is unique about what you're doing. And so, you know, in the early days, people would always ask us, they're like, so payments and like with the design focus and it starts with S, so it's like sort of like Square, right? Um, <laughs> and actually, when you think about it, uh, they're, they're two entirely different businesses in that, uh, Stripe is, is a technology product, you know, using it more or less always involves code. We, we're interested in what you can build using this, this toolkit we've developed for you uh, in a really leveraged way online. Whereas Square is, you know, entirely offline, uh, almost entirely aimed at the, the, the small business segment uh, and offer face-to-face -face transactions. Um, and, you know, I think similarly with, with lots of competitors, people who, don't, who only have a surface level understanding of your business will, uh, you know, will tend to want to lump you into some category. Uh, and it's, it, it's very important that you be able to get across what it is that not just happens to be different today in the feature set, but what's different about where you're going and, you know, in the asymptotes of these two co companies where they end up. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not only important to be able to explain it, but it's important in an existential sense in that, you know, hopefully you are doing something different. Yeah. So speaking of doing something different, I understand you now deal in Bitcoin as well. Mm. Uh, that's obviously something that's very um, interesting and a little bit controversial. Yep. Maybe you can talk about what you see as the future of alternative currencies like Bitcoin. Yep. So. You know, I mentioned earlier the uh, Tower of Babel um, effect, where online we have all these different payment systems that are uh, completely non-interoperable. And so, you know, we in the West happily use our credit cards. You know, people in Africa use a variety of mobile money systems. Same in in, in various parts of Asia. You know, people in China use their their Alipay accounts. Um, you have this perfectly connected online world and then this perfectly balkanized you know, economic landscape. Uh, and it's, it's really harmful because it means then you know, the, the, the products we use are, are artificially limited by you, know, you have the US internet and you have the Chinese internet um, as a result. Uh, and so I think Bitcoin is, what is most exciting for me about Bitcoin is, is that global aspect. It's the fact that everyone's Bitcoins are the same, everyone's Bitcoins work together with each other um, and that no one has to, you know, come along and enable Bitcoin for a certain currency. You know, there's, there's no committee that decides that Bitcoin is going to South Africa in 2018. It's just there. That's how it works. Um, and so, you know, we uh, uh, recently added uh, Bitcoin to Stripe. Um, and it's, it's one of the instruments you can accept. Uh, and from a product point of view, one of the things that we have always thought is really important is moving beyond this, you know, I render a credit card form on my site that works for a very small set of people to uh, being that universal connector for people that you just say, I want to accept money, and Stripe lets you accept money from anyone no matter what they're doing, be it Bitcoin or, or whatever. The, the other thing I'll say about Bitcoin is, I think, you know, with that, original Bitcoin paper that is, you know, phenomenally prescient in retrospect. Like, a, you know, it's, it's, it is a, a truly great standalone paper that, you know, appeared out of nowhere and still people aren't quite sure who even wrote it. Um, 
And what that's done is, you know, one, it's kicked off a, a Bitcoin movement, but two, it's kicked off a whole cryptocurrency movement that has got people thinking about this space in, in a way they weren't before. And so, you know, people are arguing about, you know, what, what is the, the perfect consensus algorithm and, you know, what are the right constants in the, you know, in the, in the hashing functions if you're going to use hashing or proof of work or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you have people arguing about every detail and, you know, you, you have some people bemoaning the the fracturing that's happening where you, ha you have all these altcoins like Litecoin and Zerocoin and things like this. Um, but, but to me, that's really exciting in that people are not only saying, you know, this is a really cool technology, but this is a really cool technology space and we should explore all the possibilities that are in it. Um, Stripe funded a, a nonprofit called Stellar, um, which is developing uh, a, a cryptocurrency. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It lets you trade. Um, not just, you know, with Bitcoin, the currency is Bitcoin, whereas with Stellar, you can actually trade dollars or euros or pounds, you know, things denominated in the actual currency. And it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't use hashing um, for, for consensus or proof of work. Um, it uses uh, kind of a more uh, CA-like model. Um, and so I, I think cryptocurrencies are totally in line with this general mission we believe in, which is, you know, the, the internet economy should not be the US, it should be the world, and we need to fight really hard to make that happen. Terrific. Who has a question? Yes. So you spoke at how to start a startup uh, course last quarter, and that pretty much went into depth about everything that's relevant to startups to a great extent. Mm -hmm. We have this amazing amount of information now available from the Valley on what we should do. But it seems like some of the best founders out there, the ones who've been most successful, didn't have this information at all. So how do you uh, attribute this ability to find out what's the right thing to do in terms of culture and hiring when no one's really told you about it? So I'm going to repeat the question. I'm going to see if I've got it. Is that, listen, there's all this how to start a company information out there. You didn't have access to it. You know, what's the difference between those people who read all the books, watch all the videos, are listening right now, and, and the people like you who did it by the seat of your pants? Um. Well, you know, I think it's it's maybe giving us a uh, you know a little bit too much credit to um, uh, to say that we succeeded, you know, in, entirely um, of our own accord, and you know had had no one helping us. You know, there's the the old quip about. Um, um, about libertarians being mostly rich people and you know believing in the uh, uh, in the power of the free market to to get them to where they are, but um, but you know I think in our case we were we were very lucky to have a lot of uh, advice from people who had who had done it before you know it'd be a people via the YC network. Um, uh, Peter Thiel was a very early investor in Stripe. You know, uh, that was that that was a fun one. He was actually our, our first significant investor. Um, you know, going into the office of Peter Thiel and saying, uh, you know, online payments are totally broken. Um, <laughs> who caused this mess? Um, <laughs> but uh, he he knows an awful lot about building companies. You know, not, not just through PayPal, but being the the first outside investor in Facebook. And you know. If, uh, a co-founder of Palantir, a variety of these other successful companies, same with um, Sequoia, things like this, or you know, studying what various companies had that you know emerged in the 70s, 80s, 90s did, um, and you know, trying to draw out the conclusions of what made them successful. Like I said, you know, if you if any of you guys want to join my fun startup history reading club, you're you're welcome to. Um, but yeah, I don't think we were we were on our own at all. There's there, there's always been a, a pretty good source of advice. And you know, going back to the the point of um, whitewashing and you know the corporate history is always tending to be a bit more of an official history. You know, for me, the best advice has always been someone who was there firsthand, who in a one-on-one -on -one context is willing to tell you not only the the official sanitized version, but and here's the time we nearly lost everyone's data, um, which actually happened for a major consumer internet company. Um, Great. Yes. What worries you most at Stripe, and um, what challenges is the company trying to overcome today? So the question is, uh, what worries you the most right now, and what challenges are you trying to overcome? Um, probably 
two things, and you know, I, th I think the, the things we worry about and the challenges are, are, are sort of the same, so I'll answer them together. Um, I think one is that uh, product, product strategy, product prioritization, product planning, whatever you want to call it, um, is always going to be really hard. And I think you know, people think um, it's, it's going to be hard if things aren't going well, but it's even hard if things are going well because you're trying to you know, model the future and see the knock-on effects of, of doing things with, with huge amounts of uncertainty. And so you know, in our case, we have a very successful, uh, you know, we have a, a very successful subscription product that we really believe in and we're expanding. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're also expanding internationally. And there's only a finite amount that we can work on. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're at a certain point faced with a choice, you know, should we be investing in subscriptions or expanding internationally? And, you know, the, the answer is both. Uh, and you have to always be making these calls and, and constantly revisiting your calls uh, when it comes to what you should be working on. Uh, and it's, it's so, so hard to predict up front what actually ends up being, being, being kind of a, a major part of, of, your, of your business. So uh, I just want to build on this. How often do you revisit your strategy? Because you, know, you can't do it every day. It's sort of like you know, yes. uh, digging up the seed every day to see if it's sprouted. <laughs> right. Okay? But you also can't do it till it's an oak and you go, oh my gosh, I really wanted a cherry. Yes. Um, I, I think the, the strategy you revisit all the time, I think what companies have to get good at is being willing to let things take the time to, 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 to be, being willing to, to give them a chance to actually go somewhere or not. Because you know, especially as the company grows, uh, you have uh, all this pressure, not just externally, but the pressure you all set on yourselves internally. Uh, and you know, one of the tougher things is saying, you know, look, I know that the needle hasn't moved in, in, you know, on this yet, but we, you know, we said initially that you know we believe this is going to be really important going forward, and we uh, we still believe that, and it's just gonna it's just gonna take time. Um, you know, I think say Bitcoin is a perfect example. You know, I think if you look at, if you go ask anyone who's accepting Bitcoin, is it a significant fraction of their of their transaction volume? The answer will be no, because the the consumer demand isn't there yet, uh, and so you're in this chicken and egg situation. Uh, and so, is it irrational for these people to to have Bitcoin on their sites? I mean, no. It's just that they want to give it that that time, uh, and so they're, they're 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 probably constantly revisiting their strategy of you know should we be investing in Bitcoin? Uh, but what the, the the secret sauce is in the patience uh, to know when you uh, when you should be giving things time, and that's that's an art. That's like really so hard to. You can be patient when it's your company and there aren't investors, but mm -hmm. you now have a lot of investors who probably have a strong opinion. So you've got a board and you meet with them. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with your board and how, maybe how you manage the board, mm -hmm. how the man board manages you? Um, you got to find patient investors. Um, I, I think the good investors get that this is how this works um, and they you know the, the good investors have also seen it some amount before and so you know in uh, Facebook's you know in Facebook's case um, uh, does anyone remember that Facebook in the very early days used to have banner ads they're, they're just going to sell ad space on Facebook that you could buy the banner at the top of the page um, but you know, it took them a few iterations before they found a, a really good revenue model that, that's that's now doing well. Uh, and so I think again, you know, in that that uh, collective amnesia that we that we all have, where there's the you know we, we only really remember the the successful stuff. Um, uh, it's it's easy to view it as you know why can't you just be like Facebook and you know quickly arrive at the correct answer uh, and it, it's important that the investors you find uh, be able to understand that part of the of the creative process. Great question. Yes. Uh, can you speak to like the personal transition you've had going from you know when you were just an engineer working in the early days to now being the CEO? Like, do you enjoy being the CEO? Or I don't actually know you're the CEO, but like co-founder. Um, like, do you, do you enjoy that role more? Do you miss coding? Do you yep. still code sometimes? Yep. Um, I'm not the CEO. I'm the president. But I'll, I'll take the suggestion to the board. 
Um, <laughs> and I, I agree for what it's worth. And uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, you, you definitely do operate uh, in a different way at every uh, at every stage of the company. Um, you know, in the early days when it's just two of you, uh, we actually spent the um, we, we spent the very early days in Stripe, uh, the first few weeks, working on it from Buenos Aires. It was a January break uh, in, in college. And we, you know, we didn't want to work in the US because we didn't have, you know, we had student visas and not work visas. We didn't want to go home to Ireland because it would be super distracting or whatever. Um, so we did the logical thing and went to Buenos Aires. Um, and it was awesome. That is like a city that works on a hacker schedule. Everything is open till 5 AM and has Wi-Fi. And it's great. Um, that's a slightly different experience to you know a 200 person company now, um, and I think what you, you you need to not guess you know you hear these stories of people who kind of uh, want to stay coding to the detriment of other things you know at a certain point you you have to acknowledge that you know the productive thing for me is not going to be you know directly doing this myself or or, or directly coding but uh, you know. Uh, we're working on working on something different, uh, and uh, you have to get out ahead of that. I think the, the other thing that you have to get good at is pretty quickly learning new skills uh, because you're going to be doing things like recruiting or you know running a board meeting or running a staff meeting or running an all hands or all this kind of stuff that you probably haven't done before. Uh, and I think it takes a uh, it, it, it requires you to be willing to be not good at things in front of a large group of people uh, and be pretty open to feedback to, to, to actually get good at those things. So on that note, are, when you look back, right? imagine you're starting all over again. It's a few years ago, because it's really only a few years. Um, are there any very specific things that you go, wow, I wish I had really done something differently that would have been really meaningful? I mean, help, help us understand so that yes. everyone here can learn from that. Yeah. I think the reassuring thing and one, you know, one pattern in a lot of the, you know, if, if you read these histories of companies, is just how much stuff they screwed up. And, and you know, that, that should be a really heartening lesson. It's, you know, you can still screw up that much stuff and get away with it. Um, you know, there was this, uh, you know, they, they talk about uh, in the early days of Google how, uh, you know, they had this uh, one machine, I think it was the script that Sergey wrote, doing all the indexing of the entire web. Uh, and at a certain point, they just like couldn't keep up with the growth of the web, and you know everything was slowing down. Search results took uh, you know m multiple seconds to actually respond. And this is when Google was getting reasonably large, um, and you know they they fixed it, and it's now you know they're, they're now hyper focused on speed. Um, but uh, it, it really was quite broken there along the way. Uh, and you know same with you know Facebook, who stumbled through lots of different revenue models before arriving at the one they wanted, things like this, and so. It's the, the reassuring thing is you can screw up a lot of stuff. Um, I think but you the, didn't, right? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> we were, luckily, um, we got everything right. Um, I, I think the two things you really can't screw up are product direction, where I mean, if you if you go down the wrong road, that's that's really hard to pull back from. Um, and the other thing is is hiring, just because you know a a bad mistake when it comes to hiring is so demotivating. It can, you know, it can spread so badly to the rest of the company that uh, you really have to get a, a lot of hires right. I, I think the other thing is, as you grow, <clears throat> you know, the correct way to view hiring is not I am filling someone to, you know, to do this role and 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 you know fill this 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 slot. It's the correct way to view hiring is is branches of a tree. That when you hire this person, you're not only bringing them, but you're bringing their effect on the culture and all the other people they're going to bring in with them. And you know the 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 the, the, the norms and the working style they have that will spread throughout the company. Um, and, and as time goes on, um, you know the, the those hires have you know you have less and less influence on the company and all the new people you're bringing in have more. Um, and so, you know, hiring, you, you can't really screw up. Great. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're going to scale that kind of hiring you're doing now? So you and Patrick still interview everyone. Um, sometimes, you know, if people go through projects before you decide to work with them, how do you do that as the company goes from 200 to 500 to them? 
So the question is, how do you scale the hiring process to know you've got the right person as you get so big? Um, that's a very relevant question. It's a, it's a discussion we're having um, internally right now. Um, uh, I think uh, a lot of it is as you, you know, go from, uh, and you know, speaking of these questions of scaling, let's be clear, you know, Stripe is 200 people right now. We're in the process of, of growing a lot. You know, we'll probably grow, um, you know, we'll add a significant number of people th this year. But you know, if, if we've messed it all up, you won't see the results until a few years down the road. And so t t take all, all my advice on scaling with a pinch of salt. Um, but with, with, with scaling in particular, I think it's moving from things being at a gut level, you know, this doesn't feel right, I'm not so sure about this, to uh, making things very explicit. And so, you know, in the early days, I think companies spend a lot of time talking about culture fit. Uh, and, you know, th uh, hopefully the various people at the company know what that means and know what set of traits that they believe are important in hires. But uh, you know, as, as the company grows, you have to make that uh, explicit. And you have to say, you know, the, the, this is the set of things we believe make someone succeed at Stripe. This is the set of traits we believe are important. This is the set of skills we think someone needs to come in from, in that role. Um, and that feels kind of weirdly artificial in the, in the early days. And it's, it's inefficient in the early days because you know, if, if you're being so explicit about everything in a fast moving environment, you'll get weighed down. But as the, you know, as the company grows, it will end up in this complete game of telephone unless you are really explicit about, you know, with something like hiring, what is important in a hire. So clearly, every single person contributes to the culture. Mm -hmm. and that's, but that's one of the variables that affects culture. Do you think about the culture of the company? You, and, and what other things do, levers do you pull to influence the culture of the organization? Yeah. Um, so everyone does. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, s some people pitch that as a, you know, as a thing to be kept in check or, you know, restrained or whatever. And, you know, people often ask the question like, you know, how do you keep the culture from changing? And I guess to me that question suggests a huge amount of hubris in that, you know, to suggest that that initial kernel of culture that you had is, you know, the perfect culture that any company could have and, and uh, does not uh, deserve any improving. Um, yeah, something seems off there. And so the correct question is not how do you keep the culture from changing, it's, what culture do you yep. want to have um, and, and how do you get there? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes you'll believe that you have that culture already and you want to, you know, you want to, you want to teach new hires that. But, but I think oftentimes, it'll, if you're being really thoughtful about it, it's about recognizing a deficiency in your culture and, and, and how do we inculcate that. Mm -hmm. And I think I can identify various points throughout the history of Stripe where the culture actually improved from you know, someone coming in and them bringing in some new culture with them. You know, so as an example of this, uh, I think in the early days, startups tend to be very fly-by-night, shoot from the hip, not at all metrics driven. Uh, and maybe that's necessary in that maybe you need to have a, you know, a clear idea of where you're going and, and ignore the data to some, to some degree. But it's really important as they grow to become more metrics oriented and actually look at usage, look at how people are using the product and, and, and bake that into to, 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 to future product development. Uh, and you know, we very d definitely started off not very metrics driven and we have become much more metrics driven over time. Uh, and I think that that was a good example of you know, a concrete place I can identify the culture as, as having improved. There are other factors that always come into play, like the physical space, mm -hmm. different rewards, yep. incentives. Do you think about that as part of the culture as well? It, it is, though it's a bit more, uh, you know, I think the, hopefully the physical space is, you know, a manifestation of something different, or sorry, a manifestation of something larger, rather than, uh, rather than, uh, you know, the culture itself and that, you know, if your culture is, you know, we have foosball, it's a bit like, cool. Okay, great. Um, but, but, you know, if your culture is, you know, at Stripe, for example, we, uh, you know, we, we serve meals at the company uh, and rather than having kind of cafe style seating with the round tables, we have long dining room tables, kind of Hogwarts style. Uh, and, uh, 
we think that's really valuable because it means that you know, in, in a fast-growing team, people get the chance to meet each other that they don't, uh, that they, they mightn't otherwise. And you know, we, we very much don't want Stripe to become these silos where you know you have the finance people and the marketing people and the engineers, and they're all in their kind of cliques. You know, we want it to be the case that people at Stripe have a lot of empathy for how different parts of the company work and, and are pretty well-rounded. And so, you know, that that's an example I would point to as you know where the space is is hopefully an indication of some larger cultural thing rather than you know, a foosball tip. Great. That's exactly what I meant. Great. Thank you. Please stand uh, up and speak really loud. What would be your advice for working or not with a person or a team? I don't, could you repeat it? Yeah. What would be your advice for working or not with a person or a team? What would be your advice for working or not working with a person or a team? Um, uh, you, you mean as a, as a co-founder or when it comes to hiring? Uh, uh, both. Okay. Um, I, I guess the two things to think about are, one, I think uh, the uh, quality and tenor of your personal interactions actually matters a lot. You know, there are some things that are absolutely table stakes like honesty and integrity. And if you see any bad signs there, you should run away at 100 miles an hour. Um, but then there's, uh, you know, there, there's deeper things about your, your interaction and your working style. Um, you know, I think uh, one interesting question that you should really think about is how much should you argue with you know, someone you're working closely with? Because it's not obvious that you want to be in, uh, you know, you clearly just don't want to be the two of the same people, or that's kind of wasteful. You you, you know you hopefully have some uh, have some conflict and some diversity of opinion, uh, such that you're both bringing different perspectives to the table. Uh, but at the same time, you probably don't want to be too far, you know, too diverse in opinions. Where you know Max Levchin uh, describes how when they merged X.com and PayPal, you know. Uh, PayPal were all Unix people, and Windows uh, or and X.com were all uh, Windows Server people, uh, and they kind of smushed them together, and it was bedlam because you had these two people who had you know red team, blue team, two completely different ways of doing things, and you know n n it's unclear whether one was you know better than the other in that context, but they certainly didn't work together, and so if you know if it's productive disagreement that. Uh, that let you know that results in a better product, then that's great. If it's kind of stylistic disagreement that you can't get past, uh, and you do just have two different approaches for for doing something, then that's maybe uh, a sign that you're not going to be able to work that well together. I'm sure that you would agree. This was absolutely fascinating. Please join me in thanking John Collison.